Hey. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Hi, my name is Allison Starr, and as you two know that I'm talking to, but everybody else may not know, I'm the director of the Cliff Gallery of Mountain View College. And uh, basically, we are staying at home and we're not having a reception for our exhibiting artist, Andrea Tostin. And um, it's because um, we were sh in shelter in place uh, as a result of uh, COVID-19. We're not gonna talk about that. We're just um, gonna spend some time talking with each other and talking with the artist, Andrea Tostin. So the exhibit that's at Mountain View Gallery right now all by itself, nobody's watching it except for maybe some of the uh, ants and any kinds of insects that have made it into the space. Um, I'm sure they're enjoying it. Hopefully not, hopefully not too much, but <laughs> hopefully it's not too some lovely places for them to make home. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be interesting to see how it turns out, right? In, in a few weeks or however long. So um, the exhibit that's there right now that Andrea spent a lot of time on is called Martyrdom. And it opened up March the 9th. Okay. Yeah. And it's supposed to run through April 3rd and her reception was supposed to be tonight. And so what we're doing, uh, we meaning there's Fabiola Valenzuela, she's going to introduce herself soon. <laughs> you go ahead and do it. Sure. I am Fabiola Valenzuela. I am the gallery assistant at Cliff Gallery. Um, yes, I am also an artist. <laughs> And I'm excited to be here and have this conversation with, with all of you, both of you. <laughs> Yay, thank you. Yay. Yeah, thank you. And then we have the artist, of course, here to Andrea Tostin. Hello, I'm Andrea Tostin. <laughs> so do you want me to do a formal uh, read of your bio? Would you like me to do that? Sure. Okay, right. So, um, of course, I'm gonna to have to read it. I, uh, I fail the test of memorizing, so. No worries. Andrea mostly is a friend and someone I admire and enjoy. So that's the most important part, right? Oh. She's a calligrapher and a bookbinder. She's been doing calligraphy for over 15 years and teaching it at Oil and Cotton, which is in Oak Cliff, for over seven years. She's been bookbinding at the Book Doctor for over six years, and she has a Bachelor of Science in Biomedical Science from Texas A&M University and a Master of Liberal Arts in Museum Studies from the University of Oklahoma. And um, I think what we'll do now, and thank you so much for being willing to do this, Andrea. Thank you. This is really great. This is fun. I'm glad we have this technology. If we didn't have this technology, wouldn't even be possible, so this is great. Yeah, I agree. So um, what's exciting about this is that we have some questions that we've, we wanna ask Andrea, and um, Andrea's prepared for them, um, at least somewhat, and um, we may like have some impromptu conversation, which I hope we will, yeah, yeah. Those are really good questions. <laughs> yeah, good. Thank you. And um, I think there's some show and tell as well. So that's exciting. Yes. So, um, Fabi, you have some questions in front of you, right? I do. <laughs> awesome. Yes. So um, I think I'll start the first one and then we can just figure out how this goes. That's what we're doing. All right. Okay. Cool. So um, I already did. Who are you and what do you do? So let's find out what your background is. Well, I'm originally from Fort Worth, Texas, and um, I have two sisters and um, my parents, they still live in Fort Worth. Um, 
My dad's originally from Louisiana. My mom's originally from Jamaica. Um, my sister, my younger sister's in Houston now, and my older sister's in Fort Worth as well. I live here in Oak Cliff. Um, trying to think, that's like my just my background background. And a lot of that has influenced the work that you have it in the Cliff Valley, correct? Yes, definitely. Um, with I was raised Catholic. Um, the color schemes I got uh, to invoke um, Jamaica and Louisiana that are in the exhibition, um, in the banners. Um, and yeah, of course, uh, social constructs, um, things of that nature. Oh, Eric's walking in. <laughs> Who is that guy? <laughs> Hi, Eric. Hey. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, also uh, just been doing a lot of uh, uh, working on myself for the past couple of years. Um, so yes, I've definitely mentioned uh, perfectionism and codependent tendencies um, as far as um, uh, towards other people, um, not substances for myself in the past, but um, uh, codependent tendencies in my relationships I mean yeah Gabby um let's see what has I know this is informal do you want me to pick any question or I've, I've looked at all of them so um any that you're uh, curious about personally or what you think okay others would want to know sure um so i know this is a it's a site specific installation so how has your practice changed over time well initially i would think in terms of just completing individual pieces um and then uh and i actually started out really painting mm. um I mean, I I, uh, I took my first calligraphy class way back in middle school, so I've been um, I've been doing calligraphy for a long time. But um, as far as um, formally uh, doing visual arts, I started out painting. I took all the um, the studio art classes available at Texas A and M. Uh, the school and we had an architecture school so it, not even in an art department not a formal art department in the architecture schools where i took oh, all my wow. studio art classes and um i i won a third place uh, by unanimous decision <laughs> <laughs> with uh this painting i remember getting so excited when my uh my painting instructor uh, told us we were going to do a monochrome exercise. Uh, we just used brown paint um, and white paint, acrylic, acrylic paint, and we had to choose a corner and mm -hmm. uh, paint that corner and, and use the, um, uh, use our fingers to measure the distance and the angles and everything and, and our brushes. And uh, I chose this corner that had an eyewash station and a, uh, a drinking fountain, as I'm just really attracted to uh, simple lines and, and pipes and, and things like that, and the bathroom door. So I was just like, oh, I know it, corner! And I did. <laughs> and Allison, you, you saw that painting. It's, a, it's hanging in my studio. I adore, I adore. it. It's gorgeous. And I got Hobby Lobby supplies for that. <laughs> I was in the, the visual art society there and uh, learned about lighting and hanging paintings and things like that. And that was way back in the late 90s. Mm. And then um, from there, um, Annette Lawrence was just wonderful and generous and gracious enough to uh, meet with me at one time. Um, when I was trying to figure out um, 
what I wanted to do or what it meant to pursue being an artist. And we had a really, really great and engaging conversation. And my youngest son, he, he was about one at that time. I was pushing him around the stroller and <laughs> um, it was really, really kind of her to meet with me. Um, I had done these series of uh, charcoal drawings and entered them into um, an art competition at Richland. At Richland, um, the, one of the Dallas Community College locations here. And Ryder Richards was the director of that gallery then if I'm not mistaken. He was he was involved. He definitely was involved with it. And oh, I'm so mad at myself. I can't remember who the judge was. But he was visiting in from Louisiana and he ended up giving all of us prizes or the prize money. So we each got like a hundred bucks. And um and I kept in touch with Ryder and met his uh wonderful wife, um oh my gosh, this is Sue Ann Reich. I believe, um, from that whole experience, but I'm going off on tangents, but um, yeah. And he, he's the one that introduced me to um, reading uh, Margaret Atwood books and I went on a whole Margaret Atwood binge after um, talking with him. But anyway, yes, individual, uh, focus on individual pieces. And then um, my friend, um, Ray Pleasant, she was the uh, over the uh, or curating the gallery at the Dallas Public Library, the main branch. And back in uh, 2017, she asked me to do a show in that gallery, the Jillian Bradshaw Gallery on the fourth floor. And that was my first time uh, really doing a complete body of work. And um, what did you show there? Those were the epistolary paper quilts. And it was a really a great first place for me to um, bring together a, a complete body of work. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, it's a, a relatively large space. And uh, at that time, as I was uh, telling y'all, I um, mainly worked in a, on a small scale and I actually had started to incorporate lettering or using my lettering more in my artwork as opposed to trying to paint. I, I really kind of uh, uh, abandoned painting because I'm my color theory. No. <laughs> no bueno. But uh, <laughs> so uh, and I'm really attracted more to uh, monochromatic and maybe maybe some splashes of color here and there but I, i'm not really good with color and um my first love has been drawing and calligraphy is really yeah. and lettering is really drawing the letters so i mm -hmm. i really have gravitated more towards that and so um for that exhibition when uh ray asked me to do that invited me to do that uh it just, it was really great because I love reading. So I was able to, um, I was listening to an episode of Fresh Air and uh, the author of Super Sad True Love Story, Gary Steinhardt was on there. And his, the, the book Super, Super, Super Sad True Love Story is an epistolary novel. Mm -hmm. And they were talking about that and I was like, oh, epistolary novel, I was like, oh. That would be that would be so good for the library because then I could just get all of these these books. People could check them out from the library. And I could and it's letter writing and correspondence and mm -hmm. journal writing and so I could could write excerpts from books and so I I did that and when I started experimenting I was like oh but it's like this a large space so I was like oh so I could sew the pages together and. Um, then I was like, ooh, origami, that'll help it look deliberate and, and bring it together. And so I, I did cross stitch on those quilts and um, origami lotus flowers, like over my, uh, pretty close to 300 
um, origami flowers on that. Mm -hmm. And five epistolary novels that um, only one of them that I hadn't read before. It was Dracula, um, The Color Purple, um, well, Dracula by Bram Stoker. I need to, uh, Stoker, I need to say the authors. Alice Walker, The Color Purple, um, a Parable of the Sower by Octavia Butler, um, uh, Screw Tape Letters by C.S. Lewis, and A Super Sad True Love Story uh, by Gary Steingart were the um, books that I use excerpts from. And I, I, um, I structured the exhibition by using the, um, the order of a story like introduction, rising action, climax, mm -hmm. falling action, and conclusion. And so I just tried to just flip to excerpts from the book, at, uh, from each book, each of the five epistolary novels at those points in the book and wrote excerpts on each of the seven um, quilts at those points. And that's how we arranged them in the gallery. And the largest one was the, the climax um, part of the novel or each of the novels. And uh, Eric helped me hang it and um, Cynthia Mulcahy, who's a wonderful artist that I've had the pleasure of collaborating with, um, she lit the show. Because of course she, she had her own gallery for a while and she's a great activist and researcher, historian. But, um, yeah, then that that led to a wonderful show with my friend James Martis at the Oak Cliff Cultural Center, um, mm -hmm. curated by Gerardo Robles. And um, then after that, uh, Betsy Belcher, a wonderful group of artists I got to uh, show over at Cedar Valley. And um, that, that continued to be the quilts. And James actually also, um, inspired me to do a few more pieces that um, incorporated writing patois in calligraphy. Mm. And because um, as I mentioned earlier, my mom's from Jamaica and uh, that led to me interviewing my, my mom and my aunt Marcia, who um, is also in Fort Worth now, she's in the States um, also, of course from my mom's side. So she's from Jamaica. And um, I, I found out that my family didn't speak Patois in the home, really. Um, my grandparents were teachers, and so they frowned upon mm. Patois being spoken in the home. And I also uh, got put into contact with a distant cousin through James Martis, because he, um, he printed out a picture of my great, great, great grandparents for me. And my cousin, Georgia Williams, I was fortunate enough to be able to get in contact with her before she passed away just a couple of weeks ago. And wow. we were responding back and forth, talking about genealogy and everything, Jane, thanks to James. And um, she, uh, she was really into genealogy research. That's how they, uh, they got connected through Ancestry.com. And then I was able to correspond with her and she, um, found connections to our roots in Ghana. And so she was supporting a school in Ghana and um, putting me in contact with other cousins on my mom's side. And so, but yeah, just uh, as uh, going from working on these individual pieces to um, incorporating more of the lettering, getting into doing complete bodies of work and uh, really getting more engaged with my my own family and the community and and um, and everything has really uh, been amazing and, uh, working at the book doctor I, I really feel that that uh, working there with Candace uh, she's the owner Candace McKay she's the owner of the book doctor uh, dear friend and the owner uh, that's really where I feel like I've been able to hone my hand skills mm -hmm. and and craft there uh but yeah i'm rambling but <laughs> <laughs> <That's> great <laughs>
Yeah, it doesn't really feel like a ramble to me. I mean, it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> it makes a whole lot of sense. You know, you know how it is when someone's talking and you start thinking about different things, remind yeah. you of certain things. And so, like, some things that came to my mind were like, um, it's, it's as if you're writing a novel or a story through your artwork in a way. Um, but, you know, I, I hesitate saying that fully because it's very abstracted. It's very, it, it's, your work is a bit narrative, but not fully, right? Yeah. So it makes sense to me after you told all that story because it's new, those, that's news to me. I didn't know anything like that. And it makes sense that the work that you did in the Cliff Gallery is what it is. Um, and, and so the next thing for me where my mind goes is how did you shift to this large scale um, type of installation and like what was your thinking uh, prior to that work being in that space like well um, I really uh, my friend Brian Jones um, uh, part of uh, Chuck and George there, he, uh, I uh, have lots of conversations with him about creating and um, what he does. And uh, he's really good at uh, giving assignments and, and things like that. And he, he definitely, I remember him mentioning uh, one, when you do one body of work, you can always pick up a thread from that and carry it into other future things that you want to do and I have I I have definitely kept that in mind um, uh, with the paper quilt show and uh, Ray Pleasant asking me to present in the library space and seeing that I could actually do some larger scale work and have it work out okay and I <laughs> made it through I was like okay when you invited me to um, present at the Cliff Gallery and it being um, a college space and uh, getting the um, floor plans and everything and having been there uh, to see uh, Lauren Cross's work, uh, Letitia Huckabee's work, um, uh, I've seen other artists work there too, but it, names escape my mind. Um, it just all of those factors coming together um it felt like my uh mind was just working on that and i just did some very loose sketches and i was like this is gonna feel good in this space and the the conversations we had together um uh on a, a studio visit um yeah when we just when you first asked me to do it my mind just started working on it and that's what came that's what came out um that's what just felt like it was supposed to go in there for me it, I, like it, it being it being that it was going to be presented to um college students mm -hmm. um felt like that's that was supposed to be the subject matter and mm -hmm. so that's what came forth I, I think you were spot on. I mean, in, in how you made it site specific for that space, everything that you just said, the responses that I had when, while we were there, um, was, they were very, very positive and very engaging, very inquisitive. And the political nature of it, um, it is a direction that I've been going and the artists that I've chosen, um, I know uh, that they, have worked that way, not all of them, but it is something that I, it's the conversation that I want to have. So, um, so anyway, you know, I want to say I'm very excited, very happy with what you did, but um, more than that, um, I'm just really grateful. That's really mainly how I feel. Um, to kind of play off of that too, though, what I know that a few students had, or, um, why paper? Like, 
where, why does this artist always work with paper or seem to work with paper or why paper? And so that would be something really interesting to talk about. Well, I, um, it's been fun to just push what I can do with paper, push the envelope of what I can do with paper. I, um, I have this book. I didn't put it out here with my other books, but, and I can't remember the author right now, but, uh, it's called on paper and it was a book about the origins of paper all the way through, um, present day uses of it. I found out things like, um, that papyrus and paper are different. So originally I would think of paper coming from Egypt, Africa, um, which in some ways it did, but I guess technically it originated in China, according to this book. Hmm. And um, just learning about the different ways of making paper, the um, how strong it is, and uh, the type of wood or rag or uh, just the different materials that it's made out of. Um, it really made me conscious of the type of toilet paper I'm using because I'm like, oh no, I don't want to be <laughs> using ancient <laughs> forest as toilet paper. Oh, it would be horrible. Wow. Um, learned about uh, the cranes. Um, Paper, our our uh, our currency, our money is the, like the strongest money in the world. It's made out of rag, and um, wow. it's 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 really amazing. Like our money is really neat, <laughs> <laughs> and um, oh, uh, just. Uh, how yeah just how important paper is how resilient it is how um how it changed it is like uh the computer of is the technology of the time period because it, it exponentially improved our ability to um it exponentially improved our ability to um communicate yeah. around the world and, and uh, just pushed us forward as a species exponentially, having paper and communicating that way. Um, but then too, um, like when you think of uh, paper hearts or uh, uh, the fragility at the same time, um, I, yeah, just all those factors coming together in my mind. It's like, yeah, and it better be made out of all paper <laughs> and just mm. sew it together and just yeah it, um it speaks to the kind of precarious nature of everything how it the way that everything works is all of us buying into certain belief systems together and um yeah if we overthink it we could it could fall apart, but we could also change it in some better ways, possibly. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad I asked that question. That's very interesting. Yeah, paper, paper is an amazing invention. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, the, the papers I used were uh, bulletin board paper and uh, newsprint paper. Those were the two papers. And then the, um, the Chinese lanterns, I just ordered those as, as is. And so those are, the, those are just the, the paper. Um, I didn't construct those by hand.